All right. Well, thank you again, everyone, for being with us. I'm going to, I want to toss out a few ideas um, up front, kind of the, uh, the most important ideas that are floating around. And lots of things are kind of passing through consciousness this morning. So in case I, in case I get lost <laughs> as we go through this, I want to get some of the most important ideas out first so that you'll have those and then can understand that everything else that comes after somehow relates to these. Hopefully. So I think the first thing that we want to understand is there is a difference between activity and struggle. So in activity we're busy, we're doing, we're moving, maybe even, maybe even sweating. But there's not a sense of struggle that goes with it. And and the you know the difference might be when we think of children at play and and people at work. If I gave you a, a shovel and asked you to go out and into the yard and dig a big hole for me, that would be work. <laughs> that would be work. It would be hot. You'd be sweaty. You'd be thirsty. But if you look at children at play at the, on the same day in the, uh, in a playground on the, on the swing set, running around playing tag, pushing pushing the, the hand-powered little merry-go-round around, you know. They're sweating, they're hot, <laughs> but there's not a sense of struggle. There's not a sense of struggle. So I, so I invite you to just keep, keep that picture I in your mind. <laughs> we don't need to struggle. Stuart Wilde wrote a little booklet that used to be very popular in a bookstore. It's called, Life Was Never Meant to Be a Struggle. And on a cover, <clears throat> the picture cover, he's kind of laying in a hammock with a big, a big glass that looks, you know, like iced tea or something in his hands, and he's just got a big smile on his face. Life was never meant to be a struggle. That's point number one. Number two, I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, and and it's kind of floating around, and I think we need to come back and nail it down a, a little bit, a little bit tighter for us. And that is the way that we, the human race, the way that we, the human race, have come to accept and to expect things. I'm going to call that the human way, for lack of a better term. That's, that's the human way, or that's race consciousness way, if you want to consider that. And it's not necessarily the spiritual way. So we need to, we need to kind of clarify that a little bit. What is the difference between the human way? What is the difference between the human way and the spiritual way? If you want to consider your spiritual growth in what might be the simplest possible terms, is we are, we are becoming more and more aware of, we are awakening hopefully a little bit more <clears throat> every day. But we are awakening to the spiritual nature of life. That's what our spiritual growth, to me, that's, that's what I'm talking about when I talk about our spiritual growth. Every day we're coming into a deeper realization of what this thing called spirit is. And we're, we're told in different teachings, you can't put new wine into old skins. You know, sometimes you have to, to clear the house down to the foundation and start over again. And what that's telling us is, as human beings, we try to take something new and we try to relate it to something we already understand. That's the way that we learn. That's what we do, you know. And that's our kind of our first step of the process is we're hearing this new information we're trying to say well how does that how does that fit into what I already know oh this is like this and this is like this and sometimes we completely miss the point we completely miss the point because we take something that is so new and so different and we try to make it fit into something that we already know And we don't, we don't really get it. We think we have it. We think we understand it. We've labeled it. But the only thing that we understand is whatever that label is. We don't have it. 
So we have to be willing to, as Buddhism tells us, we have to be willing to come with a Zen mind, with a beginner's mind. I found a quote this morning. I was just, I just kind of stumbled across a quote, and it was from uh, Tolstoy, the, the writer. And I'll paraphrase it. And it's something to the effect that if we already have an opinion, if we already have, if we are already locked into an opinion, into an idea, and particularly if we have taught other people these ideas, we've told everybody this is the way it is and this is the way it works, and then suddenly something comes along that stands in opposition and that is different than what we've already believed, we resist that. We resist that. We don't accept that. We reject it. It must be wrong. That, that has to be wrong. And we can't grow any further. We can't, we can't learn any further. We have to be willing to say, okay, everything I ever knew is possibly wrong. That I'm, willing to, I'm willing to accept that. I'm willing to explore. I'm willing to open myself up. And, and take ideas and kind of weigh them on their own merit. I think it's in John, it says, you, you must try, the, try these other gods and see if they're true or not, or try these things that people say are good and see if they're good or not. And Emerson says, take no other person's idea of what, what is good and what is bad. You must find out for yourself. And the reason for that is, is, is we tend, as human beings, we tend to reject that which is different than what we expect. In, in fact, you know, if you look at... <laughs> If you look at experiments in psychology, sometimes we don't even see that which is different than what we expect. You know, and, and magicians kind of use this misdirection. They get us expecting one thing, and then they do something else, and we never see the something else that they've done, even if they do it right under our very nose. You know, sometimes, sometimes you'll see the the magic shows where they slow down the trick, they put it in slow motion. And, and here's a close-up magician moving their hands right in front of the very nose of the people. And the people are staring intently, trying to catch this magician doing something. And, of course, the magician gives slight misdirection, gets them looking someplace else, and is able to do something that they least expected. They least expected. So if we are truly going to learn, if we are truly, truly going to discover what this thing called spirit is, what this thing called soul, or what this thing called God is, we have to be willing to st step back and say that perhaps the truth, perhaps the truth of what this is doesn't fit any of my existing concepts. Perhaps this is the new wine and I'm trying to fit it into old skins. And I have to be willing to release and to let go. Otherwise we stay stuck. We stay stuck in the old ideas, you know. One, at one point in, in, my, in my job, in my work, we would do, go out and do pro bono consulting in the, in the school districts. It was very interesting, very fascinating. I did, did some work with North Carolina A&T in Greensboro, and we worked with the, um, the Orange County schools, the Durham-Orange County schools down in the Raleigh-Durham area. Um, and I had an opportunity to meet with um, a person who had, been, um, who had been involved in the school system for many, many years and was getting ready to retire. And we were talking about this process of change in education. You know, you could, you, you see, right now there's a lot of a lot of discussion about what needs to change in, in, in the educational system. And and this this individual had been involved for her entire professional career. And we were talking about change and how difficult it was to implement change. That's that's what. That's what my role was, was about bringing about organizational change. And she shared with me that she had, twice in her career, she had an opportunity to do something different. Twice they were, they were going to go in and build new schools from the ground up. And they had an opportunity to go in and completely change the way everything was done 
and to change it in a manner that the educators knew was a better way, a better way to teach, a better way to treat the children, a better way to, to provide the environment where the education could take place. And she said what happened was when they came up with the plans and, the, and the, the school board, when the elected officials got a hold of it, and when the parents got wind of it, the PTA, there was a great pushback. There was a great pushback from the community. And parents thought schools should be the way they were when the parents went to school in the 60s. It should be reading and writing and arithmetic taught to the tune of the hickory stick. And the politicians got involved. And the politicians said, this, no, we're not going to spend money on this. This is too different. This is, this, is, <clears throat> this is not at all what a school should look like. And, of course, the politicians controlled the purse springs. And the parents elected the politicians. And what happened was everything got put back the way it was. The new school got built and it looked very much like the old schools. The new classrooms looked very much like the old classrooms. The new curriculum looked very much like the old curriculum. And nothing changed. And I just bring that out because what you and I are really trying to do when we're doing our spiritual growth is we're trying to change. We're trying to change. We, we were born into this world we immediately started to form these concepts about the way things are and the way things ought to be and the way things should be. Our parents told us certain ways, our teachers told us certain ways, our preachers told us certain ways, our friends told us certain ways. We went to work and our, and our boss and co-workers told us certain ways. We get married and our spouse tells us certain ways. And we kind of assimilate all of this and we create a world view. We create this, this mental image of the way things are and the way things ought to be. And we become very attached to that. And we try to defend that. If anything comes along to tell us that our view of the world is, is perhaps somewhat lacking, we reject that. See, we reject that. We get very defensive. Remember, Plato gave us the... the uh, um, the picture of the people who were raised in the cave and they were chained in such a manner that they could only see the shadows on the wall and they believed the shadows were reality. And one day one of them escaped his chains and he went outside and he was, first was blinded by the light. The, the cosmic consciousness, the flash of the mystical experience, this is what the metaphor is. And then he came back in the cave and he told everybody, he says, listen, everything that you've believed to be true is not true. That is only a projection of, of the reality that is taking place outside the door here. And you just can't see it because you've, you've turned in the wrong direction. You're facing the wrong way. And of course, they, they rejected that idea. This person, this person was crazy. This, this person must be confused. They went back to their old, comfortable ways. So if we, if we take those ideas that I just tossed out, right? That life doesn't have to be a struggle. Life doesn't have to be a struggle. Perhaps we need to stop thinking in the old ways and start thinking in an entirely new way if we are to get to what this main purpose of life seems to be, which is to, to awaken to awaken to our spiritual nature. <clears throat> In Buddhism, again, we have, the, we have the teaching story where somebody said to Buddha, you know, who are you? What are you? Are you a god? Are you a saint? What are you? And he said, I'm awake. I'm awake. All we are trying to do is to awaken. Excuse me when I get a drink of water. <clears throat> I read somewhere that it said, the only sin is the sin of unconsciousness. The only sin is the sin of unconsciousness. And remember, in this context, a sin is an error, like, like the archer, Mr. Mark type of sin. A sin is an error. But the only error is un being unconscious, being unconscious. 
What we're trying to do is to become conscious, to become aware. But it is not an awareness in what the human sense or the human race consciousness has told us. It is a different consciousness. It is a spiritual consciousness. The Apostle Paul says it's as if we it's as if we were looking through a glass darkly. Right? The window is dirty, the window is smudged. We're seeing all this distorted stuff on, on the window, and we believe that that is not only the way it is, but the, the only way it should be, the right way it should be, because it's our way, and we have grown up believing it, and we want to defend it. And if anybody says anything that we think is in opposition to that, we must struggle with them. We must argue with them. We must fight with them. We must beat them down, whether verbally or, or physically. We must defend these ideas that we have become vested in, we have identified with, we have attached ourselves to. And that is the sin of unconsciousness. That is the error of unconsciousness. So as human consciousness was developing, you know, kind of, if you, if you will, you know, kind of go back in time, close your eyes and go back in time and imagine a time when life was, was crawling out of the oceans coming up onto land and, and over over bazillions of years this life changed from you know little tiny creatures that crawl like snakes to things that have legs to birds that have wings to great dinosaurs to all of these things but but as evolution was moving this this progression of life forward what was also developing was awareness awareness consciousness until, as, as Troward would say, it kind of came to a head in this thing that we call a human being. Because we can, we can do something that, as far as we know, no other species can do. We can become aware of our own thoughts. We can become aware of our own thinking. And when that happens, when, when, when that takes place, then suddenly we have the ability to break the identification, to detach, to detach from the race consciousness, to detach from the old ways of thinking and the old ways of believing, and to stop trying to take everything that is new and making it fit into something that is old, and to stop rejecting anything that is different than the way that we thought it ought to be and the way that it should be. So in, in the evolution of the human race, this need for struggle, this need for struggle has become kind of uh, embedded in our consciousness. We see things as fight or flight. Remember, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. You know, is it friend, is it foe? And, and very quickly we had to identify if this, if this was a threat, you know, if this was a threat, <clears throat> we needed to fight it or we needed to run away from it. If it, if it was not... We didn't need to worry about it. We could, we could free our attention up to go someplace else. So it's, it's as if our entire, our entire life it was a matter of looking at something and quickly determining, is it a threat? Is it a threat? Should I fight it? Or should I flee? That's it. That's it. And, and that has carried over that basic idea has carried over into many of the ways that we, as human beings, conduct our lives. And it has carried over into some religions, into traditional religions. Life is a struggle. Life is a test that must be passed. It must be won. It is, it is a struggle for where you will spend eternity. You have to fight. You have to be a warrior. You have to be a soldier. And all of these things, the, the, the concept of God that, that some of these religions have created, then is that of a, of a mean, angry human being. I think it's Emmett Fox who says, you know, if you picture 
kind of a medieval um, king from the Mideast sitting on a throne, barking out orders. That's the concept of God that people created. And, it, and then it is a struggle. We have to struggle in order to gain God's favor. We have to struggle in order not to be tempted because somehow there's this, this power in the universe other than God. There's this power of evil that is trying to, to take us away. And life is a constant struggle. You see, constant struggle. And the, and the belief and the need and the necessity of that struggle is deeply, deeply embedded into the race consciousness, at least in the Western world. At least in the Western world. If you're interested in the origins of religion, go back and look at, at different worldviews, look at different religions, look at different philosophies. And what you will notice is that if that religion or if that philosophy rose up in an environment that was difficult to live in, the desert, for example. God is a harsh God. Life is a struggle. You have to eat your bread by the sweat of your brow. You have to bear your children in labor. Life is a constant struggle to keep from failing, to keep from falling. Right? And in, in some of these concepts, then even, even humanity itself is not trustworthy because there has been this tremendous fall, the, the fall of man in the, in the theology. But if you move over to an environment where, where life was not a struggle, maybe active, but not a struggle, you find a totally different concept of God, a totally different worldview, a totally different approach to life. You know? I mean, think about it. If you, if, you lived, if you lived in a lush tropical environment, you could just walk out your door and pick fruit off a tree or, or walk down to the lagoon and, and catch a fish for lunch. And there was always enough and plenty and there was never a struggle. These people developed a totally different concept of God. Life is good. Life is benevolent. We are part of it. You know, it is flowing through us. It is flowing with us. So you can see quite readily, you, <coughs> you can see by looking at these examples, that what has happened is, is that human beings have created God in their own image and likeness. And it's, a, it's a mental concept that human beings have created, that human beings have projected. And if we were to find out and to experience what this thing called the divine or this thing called spirit or this thing called love really is, we have to be able to transcend those ideas, to transform those ideas, to move beyond those ideas. Rumi's concept of beyond ideas of right doing and wrong doing, there's a field. I will meet you there. We have to be able to step beyond that. And in the discourse of, of the day, if you, if you look at what's going on in our society, of course, we, we, we now have this phenomenon called social media where everybody can share their opinion and respond and, and comment immediately. You know, years ago, things would go on, nobody would know about it. It wasn't, it wasn't so terrible. Now, all of a sudden, somebody expresses an idea and everybody else feels obligated to just pounce on them that's not true, or that is true, or I like you, or I don't like you, and I'm going to unfriend you, and all of these things where everybody is just caught up in the struggle. They're caught up in the appearances. And they're caught up in the arguing. They're caught up in the need to be right. And of course, not, not a whole lot changes, because that has that is <laughs> literally the way it's been forever. It's just that we have tools right now that make us a little bit more efficient at it, and a little bit more effective at it. So the reason we come up with the, the, the title today, which is to, to fight, flight, or transcend, is that we as human beings, we who have grown up in race consciousness, we tend to look at things in those terms. Is this something we need to struggle with? Is this something that we need to avoid? <laughs> and then there's another human, another human 
uh, tactic, which is to surrender to it, to become one with whatever this thing was that we were trying to avoid. And then there's a spiritual view, which is, which is to transcend, to transcend. So when we are looking at everything in terms of, is this something that I need to struggle with? Is it something that I need to run away with? Or is it something, you know, maybe I need to, to switch over to that side, whatever that side might be. When we're doing those things, we're not transcending. When we're doing those things, we are stuck in appearances. So that which you are arguing with, you are stuck with. I think it's, again, Emmett Fox who says, you can't put somebody in prison unless you're, you're willing to go sit there with them and guard them. Right? So if you put somebody in prison, you're in prison with them. Or your representative, the guards that you hire, are in there. So when we, when we are attached to an idea so strongly that we, that we, we want to fight with it, we want to struggle with it, we're not moving forward. We're not moving forward. We are stuck right there in that old idea. And we're not making any progress. Now you hear me talk from time to time about, about you know, the, the ego and the intellect and the soul. And the intellect likes to be right. And the ego enjoys a good fight. And for thousands of years, they've been running the show. So what tends to happen is, is we spend our day, whether we realize it or not, we spend our day constantly trying to reinforce our idea that we're right. <coughs> and feeling a need to struggle with anything that might point out the fact that we're not right. And that's where the majority of human energy is going. Don't, don't take my word for it, just watch the news. Watch the news. Everybody's trying to impose their way and impose their will on one another. Everybody wants to have an opinion and they want to be right. And, and not a whole lot of depth to it, just an opinion, you know. If you try to dig down and say, well, tell me more about that. H how do you know that that's so? What objective facts and data are you looking at to support your opinion? The, the topic quickly changes, it goes away. So the human experience as we can observe it is one that is kind of caught up in this constant activity, this constant activity. Something comes in, we have to analyze it. If it's right, if it's wrong, do we need to struggle against it? And while we are doing that, while we are preoccupied in the, the human mindset that has, that has kind of followed us over from, from survival, we don't need to do that much to survive anymore. You know, you know, we don't need to constantly, what I'm saying by much, we don't need to constantly look at everything and say, is that a threat or is that not a threat? It is a threat. Do I need to fight with it or do I need to run away from it? And that was, when we were kind of living in the wild and, and we were subject to the dangers of living in the wild, that was very useful. But we really don't have much use for that anymore. But we have not let go of that behavior. So now instead of doing it with real threats like wild animals in the jungle, we're doing it with ideas. We're doing it with other people. We're doing it with ourselves. So what we, what we want to recognize then is there is another way. There is another way. There is a spiritual way. It doesn't involve struggle. It involves transcendence. And this in itself can be, can be a problem because we as human beings have taken the same idea of I need to struggle against something in order to make progress. And no pain, no gain, it's got to be hard, all these kind of things. We have taken that into our spiritual growth. 
in many cases we have made our spiritual growth and our spiritual practice a chore. Something that needs to be wrestled with, something that needs to be fought with. You know, you, you've seen traditions where, where people would take whips and flog themselves and things like that. The flesh is weak and it needs to be forced into submission. And these ideas, and of course that which you are struggling against, you are struggling with, and you are stuck in it. You can't break free from it. You can't, you can't get out of it as long as you're willing to stay there and fight with it. There has to be another way. There has to be a better way. Now, that, that better way is not a way of indulgence. You know, so, so this is what we human beings do. We say, well, struggle's not, if struggle's not the answer, then we'll just, we'll just go ahead and indulge. <clears throat> so, so dieting is a good example, you know. We, we only diet after diet after diet after diet and we're constantly struggling and, and now you're telling me that struggle is not good so therefore I'll just, I'll just go ahead and I'll indulge. And indulgence is, is not the answer either because when we're indulging we are still stuck in it. And we're still stuck in it. So, so if we're having problems with with our weight, if we're having problems with eating healthy food and, and we fight and we fight and we fight and we fight and that doesn't work, not fighting, not fighting, not fighting, not fighting and just eating whatever we want, that's not going to work either. That's not going to work either. There has to be another way. There has to be a different way. And this, this is what I'm talking about, transcendence. So, by transcending it, I mean we have to come to see it for what it is in its spiritual truth, in its spiritual nature. Now sometimes in Buddhism we read the concept that says, well, what we're trying to do is just see things as they are. And, and people will come and say, well, that's surrender, that's, that's indulgence. It's just, oh, okay, well, this is the way it is, we'll just, we'll just be happy with it the way it is. But the way we think it is is not necessarily seeing things the way they are. We are seeing things the way our conditioned mind thinks they are. Thinks they are. So now we need to be willing to step back and say the real issue, the real issue that we are working with is our attachment our identification with our own ideas, or the ideas that we think are our own ideas. This is the way it is, this is the right way, this is the only way, this is the best way, and anybody who doesn't agree with me is wrong. And now what we need to be willing to do is to step back and say, that is conditioned mind. That is conditioned consciousness. Those are opinions. Those are the way I have been trained to see things. But I have the ability to choose to see things differently. So the first step then is, is to become that observer. Mindfulness to become aware of the fact that this opinion is rising. This judgment is rising in consciousness. This emotion is rising in consciousness. This anger is rising in consciousness. This delight is rising in consciousness. Whatever it might be, can we be aware? Can we be the observer? Can we be the witness of what is taking place in this field of consciousness, this movie projector of our mind? Instead of thinking, I am thinking this, we can say, this thought has arisen, this thought has come up. Now what that does is, this is why in meditation you, you learn to observe the gap between your breaths. There's a gap between your thoughts. If you learn in meditation to observe and enter the gap between your breaths, then it becomes, during the day, constantly during the day, not just 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes in the evening, then it becomes possible to observe the gap between the thoughts. 
And when we can observe the gap between the thoughts, we can become aware of when a new thought is arising. And at that moment, at that moment, we can become aware of the fact that it is a conditioned thought. It is a pre-programmed thought. It is a thought from the past. It is, <clears throat> it is something that is going on that is just trying to keep itself the way it was. And it may or may not be appropriate at this time. It may or may not be the way it needs to be at this time, the way it ought to be at this time. And then we can choose to act differently. We can choose to act from a spiritual place. What would we be doing if we knew we couldn't fail? What would we be doing if we knew that divine love was expressing itself as us? What would we be doing if we knew that the work that we were doing was the very love of God in action in our lives? Not in struggle in our lives, but in action in our lives. What would we be doing if we knew that everything was for us and nothing was against us? And immediately when we say that, what happens is, is, but that's not the way the world works. And why is it that that's not the way the world works? Because that's not the way the world believes it should work. What we are doing is, is we are breaking the sin of unconsciousness. We are breaking our attachment to the idea that simply because it has always been that way, it needs to continue in that way. We are the point. We are the point where a new beginning is taking place. We are the point in consciousness where something different is taking place. We don't have to be caught up in a tradition no matter how old that tradition is, we don't have to be caught up in that tradition if that tradition no longer serves us. It may have been perfectly useful at one time, but times have changed, and we have changed. This very act, <clears throat> so sometimes we get, we get into this discussion, people say, but how do I do that? How do I change it? First start with observations. First start with mindfulness. And in that moment that you observe, you are aware then that you have a choice. And you are the only chooser in your universe. I can choose to do things in the old way. I can choose to react in the old way. I can choose to be angry or happy in the old way. Or I can choose to recognize that I am the one observing these things and I can be affected or not by what is going on in front of me. And I can choose to act differently if I so desire. Becoming aware and recognizing that we have a choice when we do that, usually, right then, we're able to change. We're able to change the situation. It kind of takes the sting out of it. So we've gone through life and we've been told, I have no choice but to do this, I have no choice but to do that. The, the only way to act and react was this way or that way or the other way. And our legal system even says, well, we'll get 12 reasonable people and we'll ask them what they would do. As if there were 12 reasonable people. They're going to say, well, based on the way it's always been, this is the way it should be. Based on my experience, whenever I've seen somebody do this, they were doing it because of that, so this person must be doing it because of that. They're all projecting, and that's probably the key word, projecting. We are all viewing life as our, as our old beliefs are projecting them onto the screen in front of our consciousness. And we want to stop that. We want to break that cycle. We want to stop that projection. So in transcendence then, in, in moving away from it, when we start to look at things spiritually, we, when we look at things from a human point of view, we might look at them and label them as right or wrong, and we need to struggle against them. And when we step back far enough, we, we see them as simply the outpicturing of human consciousness as it exists today. 
all of these things that people are doing to one another and perhaps to us, all of these things that they're doing, they are doing because their past programming tells them that's the way it ought to be. They're doing because they have no ability to look at something that disagrees with what they already believe and accept something different. Everything that you are seeing in the world is a projection of that consciousness. That's all it is. That's all it is. Now, do you struggle with the shadow? <laughs> the effect? Or do you go and change the cause? And the cause is your consciousness. What you're seeing it reflected back to you is what you are expecting. It is what you are accepting. It is what's on your mind. It is what's on your mind. So the way that we transcend then is not to get caught up in a struggle. Now I'm not saying that you don't take activity. We do take activity. If people are sick, we take care of them. If people are hungry, we feed them. Of course we take care. Of course we're active. Of course we're busy. But we don't do it from a sense of struggle. We find a higher purpose, a deeper purpose, a purpose of being God's instruments in action. So the transcension, the transformation, just as the fight or flight is something that has taken place in our individualized consciousness because we expected it, we believed that we were programmed that way from from God only knows when, you know, from, from this lifetime and maybe others, we don't know. But we can change that. We can transcend that. We can transform that. We can ask ourselves, what is the spiritual truth of this situation and what is it that I wish to have happen now? What is it I wish to have happen now? So the clock goes off in the morning and we jump up and we make the coffee and we start getting dressed and we get ready to go to work and we turn on the radio, we turn on the TV, we turn on the news, we get busy, 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 busy. We're, we're being bombarded with information. We're driving the car, there's people cutting us off, there's all these other things going on and we are stuck in the day as it was yesterday and the day before and the day before. And we need to start by finding that gap. What do I want to have happen now? What do I want to have happen now? So the practical advice then is to break this cycle of stuckness, to break this cycle of fight or flight <clears throat> or surrender <laughs> to it, you know. Uh, the other thing any, uh, I just remember is any, I put in the email is sometimes what we do in the way that we surrender to it is, is we justify it. It's okay when we do this. It's not okay when everybody else does it. When they do it, it's wrong. We need to fight against it. When we do it, it's, it's justified and it's, and it's good and it's worthy. That's still indulging. That's still indulging in it. And we have to stop and ask ourselves, well, what is, what is the spiritual truth here? What do I want to have happen now? Why am I investing units of my life energy in this particular activity? Why do I believe in the need to struggle? You know, why do I believe that things are against me and I need to run away? Isn't it just as easy to believe that divine love has created me out of itself and it's it's for me. All of God is for me. None of God is against me. So I invite you as you go forward this day, as you go forward in the week, when you find yourself kind of, your, your mind is kind of in a whir, you know, and you're kind of caught up in something, stop, 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 stop. Take a breath. Find a gap. And ask yourself, do I really want to be involved? Is this what I really want to put my energy into? Is there another way? Is there a better way? How would divine love see this situation? 
life was not meant to be a struggle, but we, we had to evolve past that idea. We had to move past that idea. It doesn't have to be a struggle. We don't need to spend time moving from struggle to struggle to struggle. We don't need to spend time mindlessly doing things that we haven't consciously chosen to do, even if they're not a struggle, even if they're fun things to do. You know? Why am I doing that now? Is that really, is that really what I want to do? Is that really the way that I want to let spirit express through me this day? So when we start to transcend, we start to recognize then that there is a higher purpose, there is a deeper purpose. Instead of just trying to survive, instead of just trying to get through the day, we have an opportunity to be loved today. We have an opportunity to be loving today. We have an opportunity to offer a smile and kindness or perhaps a meal. We're physically caring, you know, taking care of someone, doing all the things that are activities. But we're not doing it out of a sense of struggle. We're not doing it because we got to do them to gain merits with God so we can get to heaven when we die, kind of thing. We're doing them because it is our very nature to do so. And our very nature is love. Take time, practice, just like you would practice anything. Take time, practice. Find the gap between your breaths. Practice. Breathe in. There's a gap. Breathe out. There's a gap. Find the gap between your thoughts. Oh look, here comes a thought. There goes a thought. Here comes another thought. Find that gap. Be still in that gap. Be still in that gap. Undifferentiated mind. Be still in that gap. And then as things arise, you can say to yourself, is that worthy of my time? Is that worthy of my attention? Do I really need to struggle with that? Is there a better way? Is there another way? Is there a spiritual way? And I think you'll find one. And so it is.